page 173, the morale and discipline of revolutionary fighters. We all know what our rebel army was, and because we are familiar with it, we tend to undervalue the feat of our emancipation, one with the blood of 20,000 martyrs and the immense surge of the people. There are, however, profound reasons that made this triumph a reality. The dictatorship created the necessary ferment with its policy of oppression of the masses and maintenance of a regime of privilege, privileges for the regime's lackeys, for the parasitic latifundistas and the businessmen, privileges for the foreign monopolies. Once the conflict broke out, the regime's repressive Repressive measures and its brutality, far from diminishing popular resistance, increased it. The demoralization and the shamelessness of the military caste facilitated the task. The ruggedness of the mountains in the Oriente, plus our enemy's tactical ineptitude, also did their share. But this war was won by the people through the action of its armed fighting vanguard, the rebel army, whose basic weapons were their morale and their discipline. Discipline and morale are the foundations on which the strength of an army rests, whatever its composition. Let us examine both terms. The morale of an army has two aspects which complement each other. There's a morale in the ethical sense of the word, and there's a morale in its heroic sense. Any armed group, if it is to achieve excellence, must have both. Ethical morale has changed with the passage of time, in accordance with the prevailing ideas of a given society, pillaging homes and carrying off all objects of value was considered correct in feudal society, but carrying off women as a token of victory would have violated moral obligations. An army that behaved thus as an established policy would not be conducting itself according to the values of the epic. However, prior to that period, there was considered the correct, this was considered the correct thing to do. And the women of the conquered became part of the patrimony of the conquerors. All armies must guard their ethical, moral, morale zealously as a substantial element of their structure, as a factor of struggle, as a factor in toughening a soldier. Morale in a heroic sense is that combative drive, <clears throat> that combative drive, that faith in the final victory and in the justice of their cause, which leads soldiers to carry out the most extraordinary deeds of valor. The French Ma Cassards, who undertook their struggle, a seemingly hopeless one under arduous conditions, were faced by overwhelming adversity. Yet the conviction with which they fought for a just cause, the indignation that the Nazi bestialities and crimes evoked in them, led them to carry on until victory. They had fighting morale. The Yugoslav guerrero Guerreros, the Guerreros, their country occupied by a power 50 times their superior threw themselves into the struggle and persisted, never wavering until they conquered. They had fighting morale, the defenders of Stalingrad, with forces many times inferior to those of the enemy, with the river at their backs, resisted the long and overwhelming offensive. They demanded each hill and each ditch, each house. In each room within each street, each sidewalk of the city, until the Soviet army was able to mount an offensive and establish a huge blockade, destroying, overcoming, and making prisoners of their attackers. They had fought fighting morale. If we want a more remote example, the defenders of Verdun repulsed one offensive after another and stopped an army many times their superior in number and in weaponry. Weaponry. They had fighting morale. The rebel army on the battlefield of the Sierras and the Yanos had fighting morale, and that is just what the mercenary army lacked in its confrontation with the guerrilla deluge. We felt genuinely the forceful words of our national anthem, to die for the fatherland is to live. They knew the words, but did not feel them inside themselves. The sentiment of justice that prevailed in one cause, and the sentiment of not knowing why you were fighting in the other, created great differences between the soldiers of the two sides. There is a nexus that transforms the two types of morale the ethical and the fighting into a harmonious unit discipline. There are distinct forms of discipline, but fundamentally there is an external discipline and an internal discipline. Militarist regimes are constantly working to procure the former. 
In this respect, also, the difference between the two armies are observable. The dictatorship's army exercises its morale, its barracks, room discipline, external, mechanical, cold. This produced a soldier of remarkable external discipline and an underdeveloped internal one. This automatically diminishes his fighting morale. Fighting for what? For whom? Fighting to, prefer, to preserve certain private sinecures? For the soldier fighting for the right to plunder, to play the thief in uniform. For such rights, people will fight only up to a certain point until the sacrifice of their life is demanded of them. On the other side, an army with an enormous ethical morale, a non-existent external discipline, and an unbending internal discipline born of conviction, the rebel soldier did not drink, not because his superior officer would punish him, but because he knew. He should not drink because his morale imposed abstinence on him in his internal discipline. Strengthened that morale imposed by the army, he had joined that army simply to fight because he understood it to be his duty to give his life for a cause. Morale was growing and discipline was becoming stronger. Our army was becoming invincible, but peace, the product of victory, came and this led to the great clash between two concepts and two organizations. The old form of organization based on external Mechanical discipline forced into rigid patterns, and the new, based on interior discipline without pre-established patterns. From that clash arose the difficulties familiar to all of us concerning the ultimate structuring of our, of our army. Today the problem has been solved after we analyzed and understood that we are trying to provide our rebel armed forces with the minimum of necessary mechanical Discipline required for the harmonious functioning of large units with the maximum of internal discipline grown out of the study and understanding of our revolutionary duties. Today is yesterday. Although an apparatus exists that is devoted specifically to punishing offenses, discipline cannot derive totally from an external mechanism but must be achieved through an internal eagerness to overcome all the errors committed. How to accomplish this? It is a task requiring patience on the part of the revolutionary instructors who are disseminating Amongst the mass of our army, the great national goals, as with armies the world over, the members of our army must respect their superior officers, they must obey orders at once, they must serve tirelessly wherever dispatched, but they must also act as both social researcher and judge as social researchers. Their contact with the people enables them to ascertain its prevailing sentiments, which they can communicate to the upper echelons for constructive purposes as judges. They have the duty to de denounce any kind of abuse committed within the army or outside it in an effort to eliminate it. This very task of the rebel army proves the value of internal discipline, the goal of which is the perfecting of the individual just as it was in the Sierra. The rebel soldier must not drink, not because of the punishment that may be inflicted by the disciplinary organism, but simply because the cause that we defend the cause of the poor and all the people requires us not to drink so that the mind of every soldier is alert, his body agile, and his morale high. He must remember that today as yesterday, the rebel is the sign of sure of all eyes and constitutes an example for the people. There, there is and can be no great army if the bulk of the population is not convinced of the immense moral strength we possess today. Our armed strength is not limited to those who wear the uniform. The entire people is with us, and thus it must be. We must see to it that it shall be considered an honor by the people, workers, peasants, students, professionals, to carry the weapon which permits it to struggle in giving cases alongside those who wear the uniform of the armed forces. We must then serve as helmsmen for the civilian population, much more difficult than fighting, much more difficult than working that task of peaceful national construction is the maintenance of the necessary direction without deviating from it by an inch at any time when sufficient cohesion is achieved in our armed forces and our fighting morale is joined by a high ethical morale along with the indispensable complement of internal and external discipline, then we have achieved the firm and lasting foundation for the great army of the future, the people of Cuba. Page 178, The Struggle Against Banditry. Coming up.